Welcome to the first ever Squash Skills podcast. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Jesse Engelbrecht and Paul Carter to join me. Today we're going to be having a chat about coaching philosophies and uh, both Paul and Jesse's journey through the game and, and then into their coaching careers. So first of all guys, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Thanks, Thanks. Jethro. Jethro. Forward to it. Looking forward to it. So uh, Paul, I want to start with you. Uh, I wanted to just get a little bit of background about your kind of early early days and your early coaching setup that, that you came through on your way to becoming you know, British national champion and then on to obviously uh, England national coach and you know, winning multiple world titles. So if you can give us a, a brief history. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I just started playing squash down at the, the local squash club, literally two and a half miles down the road at Potter's Bar Squash Club from about the age of 13, 14. Um, just played once, twice a week. Started to really enjoy the sport, uh, love football. Football was my passion. Wasn't um, the age of 16, I was about five foot two. So, you know, back in the day when you play football, it was a bit blood and guts and uh, got sort of put off by the knocks uh, and then started to play a little bit more squash. But never really had any sort of formal coaching at that age. Just just literally playing club night and, you know, playing box league. Started off in League 53, believe it or not, out of a, 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 a league of 65, 65, a club of 65 leagues with six in a league. So, yeah, so I learnt me trade playing, um, you know, the, the sort of lob drop merchant, uh, the blocker, the whatever of uh, uh, that, the whole range of players that you could, you could come across. Yeah, so that was my sort of the early part of squash. And then really I, I turned full-time when I was 21 uh, and I had the opportunity to go down to Wembley. I had a trial down at Wembley with uh, Ramit Khan uh, and, and was invited in to join that group for a, about 18 months I stayed there and, you know, trained with the likes of Jahangir. So uh, that was my sort of my sort of background to a very brief history of my background in squash. And what was that environment like with Ramit just uh, in terms of a training environment <laughs> before we move on? Oh, I mean, it, was, it, was, it was totally eye-opening to me. I came from, from, came from Potters Bar, Hertfordshire, played sort of under 19 uh, county squash for Hertfordshire and, and senior squash. But that, you know, going down to Wembley was a world apart. It was, it was professional. Um, I think probably <laughs> I sort of got to Friday afternoon after doing five days in a row down there and literally couldn't walk until Monday. So you, you, could, you can guess it was pretty, it was pretty physical. Uh, having said that, you know, he, he insisted, Ramit insisted that before we started to train, we had to do an hour solo practice. And I would actually say that hour solo practice today was probably my, my greatest learning of how to hit squash ball. And then in terms of the training then, was that routines and then condition games and then playing fairly typical to today or? Uh, it was a lot of routines, a lot of condition games and a lot, a lot of match play. I think, I think there's, I think, Probably even in my coaching now, it's sort of drifted away. We've done a lot of condition games, a lot of practices, a lot of routines, whichever way you only want to do it. But I think there's a lot more emphasis on actual match play, best of threes, you know, rotating around the guy. So I think I learned a lot through through playing rather than actually uh, through what I would call set routines with, with Ramit. Okay, fantastic. There was, some, there was some individual coaching with them as well. There's some technical coaching, but not not a lot. Well, we'll come back and we'll touch upon uh, upon yeah. that uh, a little bit later on. So, Jess, I want to just throw the same question out to you, really, and just get a little bit of background on your junior career and the coaching environments you were involved with. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, probably very different, I suppose. I grew up uh, in in Zimbabwe, so very uh, sport based. Like Cards alluded to, um, he did football. You know, by by one o'clock every day, we were doing multiple different sports, and it was only by like eighteen I really had to think about choosing which sport I wanted to do. I was really good at athletics. I was a national athlete, um, but then squash for me was much more exciting, much more interesting. So, I think my environment from twelve till eighteen was pretty much borrowing from other sports just learning learning through hockey cricket tennis golf athletics and transferring those skills onto a squash court if i'm honest mm. it, it wasn't mm. much wasn't much direction if i'm honest there wasn't yeah. much um how to hit a squash ball <laughs> it was just like right you know what here's your environment uh again like i said matches we learned through so many matches so what i found really interesting was was i had that frame of reference between 12 and 18 and i came to the uk when i was I was just turned 19 to, to go pro. And I remember getting on court. I, it, was, it was one of the very early um, National League matches at that point. And I was playing Ben Ford. And, and Ben Ford was quite an established player. And it was like, oh, yeah, Ben Ford, he's pretty decent. And no one knew who I was my first week in the UK. And ended up beating him quite comfortably in, in about 25 minutes. And 
like there was like this condescending like line where where basically heard someone say like oh he's just he's just he just just runs him he just gets everything back <laughs> I, I was weirdly proud of that i was like well yeah i haven't really I don't. learned how, yeah i haven't learned how to play but i was effective in that thing and someone like uh, that the player was very technical and knew how to play the game and won lots of junior titles and yeah it just came and caused disruption so yeah my environment was pretty much learned through other sports transferred to squash and only when i came to the uk it got a lot more specific in yeah. regard to, right your drills your routines your gym your stretching all that type yeah. of stuff so yeah quite a quite an interesting uh, path and well what about you jeff what, what was your your journey through it yeah i guess i was lucky enough to be involved in the welsh setup from a fairly well, a very young age from about eight or nine uh so there was there was a structured uh, kind of training environment there but it wasn't necessarily all that regular you know being invited to Welsh squads so outside of that I was very much lots of one-on-ones uh, I was I grew up on a, a sheep farm in Wales so it was always a bit of a commitment for me to get down to a squash club uh, so I wasn't just hanging up you know hanging around the club like as lots of players can do you know having a social I was getting taken mm. to sessions by my old man and you know, was fortunate enough to have some some very good coaches on the way. Started off with Gareth Edwards, uh, and then and then Matthew Crowley, and I spent a lot of time at the front of the court hitting balls, hitting straight drives, and fine tuning technique, which I've you know I know Karts finds uh, highly amusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but believe it or not, that was that was a, a lot of a lot of my time. Uh, and then obviously outside of that getting involved with the, the Welsh squad. We had regional squads, we had squads after school, and then we'd have weekend squads. So there was, there was actually quite a lot of kind of routines and condition games there. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that was it. But I think, yeah, I definitely came from a very technical background, spent a lot of time with Matthew hitting a lot of balls, uh, but then got that, you know, that playing environment uh, alongside it with him. What I'm interested in from, from Jethro and Carter as well is, is I suppose the environments that, that, that you had as a junior and, and growing up and learning and playing and winning tournaments, as, as then thinking about a coach, what, what did you take and then transfer into your coaching philosophies? You know, for me, that, that's a real interesting thing, the transferability of your playing days into your coaching days. What's your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think we, we, we've, we spoke about this before, uh, Jess, when we were away doing that coaching course the other, the other month. I think certainly with my role at the club now, you, you, as a coach, you're expected to install all the information in the players. And, and I think I'm very similar to you, obviously, I'm considerably older. I, mean, I definitely learned my art of, of sport through, through playing lots of different sports. And I think, I think youngsters seem to want to you know, get into the sport early and and rely on the coach to actually tell them and feed them all the information. And yeah, totally. I think, you know, and I think we're all probably a little bit guilty of that. You know, you're earning a living through being a professional coach and you, you want to be able to help and, 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 and give the information. But, uh, you know, what you said, it really does ring bells in, in, with, with me. And I, I think I, I, I had monumental battles with my old man in the garden playing badminton. You know, at a young age, he'd wait for him to get from work. And I learned that hand-eye sort of stuff. And, and then we went, went down to Wales, Jethro, for our, for our summer holidays to Nuki every year. You know, when the tide went out, we'd mark a little, you know, uh, tennis court up, you know, and we'd be batting, batting ball and all those sort of things that, that were, I found, very easy to transfer across to, 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 to squash, you know. And I know I'd be really pure, my technique wasn't great and, uh, 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 and that. And, you know, and I've had it said, oh, if I was as fit as Carter, I'd beat him. So I, I, I very much would like, you know, what you said there. I think I... I sort of, I, I still believe in in that as being a massive fundamental part of the sport and, and being supremely fit. And you know, if you've got the other bits as well, you know. Yeah. So, so I suppose that that's then really what I'm curious about is, I suppose the modern world we live in, there's there's this expectation for the coach, like you said, to be this fountain of knowledge and transfer all this knowledge across to the players. But what you're alluding to is, is, is that that process of discovery needs to come from the players themselves. And the question I'm trying to get at is how do you stimulate your students to do that without you just giving them the information and spoon feeding? How would you try and get that philosophy across? It's a, it's a very challenging one, isn't it? I think, there's not, I think the, the youngsters of today have a, a great opportunity to watch a lot more squash. And I think 
you know, the, 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 you've got the squash girl site for one, you know, then you've got the PSA TV. You can see, you can see different styles. And I think it's very much for the players to actually learn and, and, and understand their body types, you know, tall, short, whatever they might be, and look at the pros that, that fit those and start to think, well, actually, that, that style of game might be my style of game, whereas the coach might be saying something slightly different. So it's trying to give them a, opportunities that they can see different styles of the sport. You know, we, we probably all three of us will agree there are some, there's some non-negotiables that, that, that they have to achieve. But, you know, down at Canary Wharf, obviously the last tournament that, 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 that's happened before this, this terrible crisis, you know, and you're watching, watching the guys, and it's all different styles, all different techniques. And, you know, as a junior, we, we took our Middlesex crew down there and, uh, you know, they, they, they absolutely love watching these guys and looking at different ways. You, you picked up the conversations with them the week after. They love the way Ali Farag played. They love the way that James will. You know, they, they, they're getting these ideas. And I think the more we can show them that, the more we can get them uh, expressing themselves with some guidance, uh, I think that I think deeper le- deep, deeper learning. I think. So awesome, I, yeah, I'm well. always intrigued by, you know, having worked with multiple different coaches from many different stables and different philosophies now with through squash skills. Do you want to see people fit, work things out for themselves, or is there an advantage to diving in and fixing something quickly? You know, so, so Malcolm Wilstrop, for example, he's happy for players Mm. to take almost months to figure something Mm. out. He'll let them work it out. He'll Mm. shout from the balcony. Mm. Just get your Mm. racket up a bit. Get your racket up a bit. Whereas, you know, if somebody was coaching in a one-on-one scenario, you know, they could get in there, they could lift that racket up and and really fine-tune a swing potentially in in 45 minutes. But I don't know what your take on those philosophies are and, and what that means to the quality of the player that's produced long term or you know is there a quick fix or do you think that long term figuring it out kind of is more beneficial in the long run i'll let you go jess with that one if you want to yeah geez um i, I think maybe like you cause because we do a lot of um coach discussion and and, and thinking about different philosophies for me it's 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 ever changing evolving but if you were to ask me the question now like you did today i would say i'm very much more in the creating that environment where the player can have that deeper learning uh, themselves, you know, figure it out for themselves. And so I, I, I massively respect what Malcolm does and I understand it. But what I'm trying to challenge my players to do of late is, is this, it's a little strap line I've been using a lot lately is repetition without repetition is can you set the task up in a way that the player is going to, I suppose, repeat the same tactic, the same shot, the same execution under pressure but actually not know they're repeating it, if that makes sense. Whereas the, you know, the drop drive, let's hit like a hundred drop and drives down the line and okay, you got a good drive from the front. I don't think that skill is sustainable under pressure and under different contexts of a match because it's a kind learning environment. So a big thing I'm trying to do of late is, is trying to get that balance between, yes, there needs to be a, a kind learning environment for the feel of a certain shot, but can you take that environment into what, what's called a wicked environment where it's a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more variability but that skill still be able to hold up under pressure and i think that's that's the i suppose the skill i'm trying to challenge myself as a coach at the moment is going how much do we move that environment for said player i think it depends on on the player in front of yours i think you've got to understand your players but in a generalization if i've got a big group of you know 12 15 kids i i, I work in that kind to wicked environment and and try and get them to solve it themselves because when it feels like it's from themselves it feels for me that that's more sustainable and can be called upon under a pressure situation so that's where i'm currently sitting with it and it might change again slightly so i don't think i've done much technical stuff in the last probably 12 to 18 months it's definitely there in the back of my mind but i will maybe mention a little nugget but the focus will be more on the environment and and that in that chaos chaotic to kind world so that's where i'm sitting for it right now that might sound a whole bunch of confusion but yeah it's, it's quite an interesting challenge i'm putting on myself there and what about you Karts? what's your kind of take on technique and technique versus tactics and you know and, and letting players figure it out versus putting mm. the technical input in i mean i've been around for, for a long long time now and, and obviously at the early days of england squash you know we had we had the uh 
the luxury of, of working with players on a, on a regular basis, one-on-one. -on -one. And I certainly think there's an element, I, I feel, for my coaching, that if I can get X amount of sessions in one-on-one, -on -one, so we're all talking the same language. So then when I throw those players in on a group, we're not having to stop and explain things. So it's, it's this, this and this, and they know. Then, then the session seems to flow. And I think, you know, uh, DP and myself had a, a, a lot of success in, the, in those early days because of that. I think that Dave has a slightly different way of coaching to me, but we were talking a very similar language. And then when we got these guys together as a, a squad, a national squad, the squads just, just flowed because there'd been that, that input one-on-one. -on -one, and then the, the same sort of ideas were, were, were um, uh, uh, challenged, but in, in a group environment. Now, with Middlesex, which, you know, we're, 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 we're a new stage at the moment, but that's definitely been the case. It's probably been about 18 months of quite a lot of one-on-ones and getting people into that, that technical way of thinking and understanding what the, what the non-negotiables are. And now the squads seem to work really well because we're all on the same page. I think it's very hard for coaches to get a group together because their understand, you know, one individual's understanding of something is different to the other and then the, the session doesn't flow. So the stuff that Adam and I are doing over at, at Burko at the moment with one of England uh, hub, hub clubs, uh, you know, the guys have had a lot of individual coaching and now the, the, the sessions seem to flow. And I think you can, as, as Jeff said, you can create that, that, that deeper learning through, through those conditions. But I think you need to install some of the, 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 the non-negotiables at the start. Yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense to me, that kind of combination of of one on one or one on ones and then those group environments. It sounds very similar to what yes. I was exposed to within Wales growing up. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I've, I've done a lot of one on ones with a couple of guys, some of the older guys at a club in the box leagues. And, uh, you know, I get a few of the guys to, to they want me to watch them. And, you know, the first time they're, they're playing, and they're sort of trying to show me all the technique, all the technical stuff they're doing. And they're not actually playing the game of squash. So it's a big learning curve for me. It's like, oh, play your game and then we're, 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 we'll adjust the technique. Don't show me your technique because that's not, that's not, what we're, not, what, not what's being tested here. It's about how you play. Um, so it's, it's, it's getting that link between, between the technical and the tactical and still being able to play a game of squash and enjoy it. So I guess this is a question, I had it a little further down the list, but I wanted to talk about where your first ports of call are when you start working with a new player. So I guess it's, it's challenging you know, if you maybe see them at club night, what's the first thing you're looking at about how to improve their game? Is it a technical thing or is it a tactical thing? Generally, where would you be? Um, if I put my, my club, club hat on now, um, I think with my slightly players that's lower down in the box leagues, I think I'd definitely go for a tactical input first. And it might be something very, very simple, like just hitting the ball higher on the front wall. Mm. You know, people have an experience opening, you know, and then like, a bit like what you were saying earlier, Jess, you know, but just by saying hit the ball higher on the front wall, they already make that adaption, naturally make an adaption to open the racket base and hit the ball higher on the front wall. When I, when I work with the, yeah. the, the top guys, and I might be going a little bit more technical and think about early racket preparation, getting into a strong position, showing one shot plan and other, all those sort of things that, you know, the pros will be doing. So I think it does, it does, it drifts. From, from where the player is on the player pathway. If it's a player that comes once a week on, a, on, on to one of my sessions and they just want to come and have a good workout, we just, we just go through some conditions. Some of them like it, some of them don't. They've had a great workout and they come back next week. And it's, 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 it's known where you start to move that player up. They've got an appetite, they've got the ability, they've got a little bit of time to actually put to it. They put another session in a week. A lot, a lot of the guys will only come once a week. Mm. But Kites, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, which, which for me is, is, is amazing to hear you say it. Is the, um, you didn't say it directly, but it's, it's knowing your player, isn't it? It's knowing yeah. their reasons, their motivations, yeah. um, as I said, time constraints. And I think yeah. one of the messages, because you do a lot of coach education, I'm trying to help some young coaches. Some young coaches will have a copy and pay session. They'll go, we'll do this session with yeah. the six individuals we'll have throughout that day. And I suppose that's the experience that comes later on, like yourself and maybe a little bit of me, where you, you get to really understand the person in front of you. And, and, and that, that for me is some big advice that I I think we both found translates well to young coaches, but also maybe translates well to the club player because yeah. I don't know if you do it, but very often if you're having the very first session with one of the club players, you go, so, so, so what do you want to get out of this? Mm. And sometimes you mm. just meet with a blank face and going, well, you're the expert. You're the you coach. Tell me what I <laughs> and it's like, well, no, like, and, and for me, sometimes that's a, that's a 20 minute conversation at the first lesson is going, 
well, no, it's actually worth more worthwhile rather than me just insisting you do X, Y, and Z. It's like, actually understand yourself, understand your game. Where do you want to go with it? Yeah. And then we can really start to align our philosophies uh, together. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the problem is we're so pushed for time all the time that you get your, your lessons come through, your groups, your individuals. Whereas if you had, if you had, you know, if you had all the time in the world, your, your philosophy or your, your, sorry, your journey with that player would probably start down at the coffee shop. And that'd be an hour chatting about what you're going to be doing. Then you go and call, then you probably have another chat afterwards. And, it, you know, rather than just rock up five o'clock on a Monday night for your session, next, see you next week. It's, it's that, you know, get develop it. And I think that's where, you know, when, when I was employed by England Squash, I certainly had that time to be able to do that. And I know, you know, we used to call it Costa Friday. That used to be the Friday afternoon down at Costa with all the guys, uh, nice. you know, and we'd sit and we'd, we'd talk about the week that we've, how, how that week's worked but you know I don't think many coaches uh, have that luxury uh, to, to spend that time with the players and, and, and chat and, and, and build those sort of those relationships away from the squash court interesting yeah 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 it is an interesting one and I think the challenge we all face as we say it's is how much time does a player have to work on their game and it's about identifying the the things that will make the biggest difference to their game to yep. work on at that time but also yep. to be done in such a way that it becomes enjoyable for yep. them so as you say if it's a club player who's only going to get to get to play three times a week and is he yep. going to want to stand on court and just yep. do a load of technical work and not get a workout yeah versus versus getting a good sweat and, and learning a bit about the game so this is the challenge, isn't it? And the challenge that we constantly face on squash skills is trying to pitch the coaching to the different levels because mm. it can be very difficult or, or different pitching something to a professional player, as you say, has loads of time to go and make minor adjustments and work on them day in, day out, you know, twice yep. a day. Yeah. And then gradually build them into their game. But those same yeah. those same changes might take months for somebody uh, you know an amateur player to figure out so there's absolutely you ask a simple question can't you to uh, you know some of the players but where 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 do you aim to hit a a cross court or the back corner well you might do on certain situations but other situations it's not it's just simple things like that that the the players you know they need they need those conditions to actually explain why they're hitting that back corner or why they hit the, the side ball slightly further forward you know, time and time again of doing those practices, they start to realise where they need to hit the ball. So it's, um, it's very difficult. It's, it's, it's really difficult. Well, there's ultimately no one way to play squash. There's no one Clearly. way to coach squash. Yeah. And, you know, all, all these players that we work with as coaches have, they're on this sliding scale from the amount of time and resources that they, they have available. For but, sure. I mean, so... You know, if we're speaking about the, a typical pl- club player who's kind of playing three, four times a week, who definitely wants to get that competitive play in at least twice a week, where would you both say they should be putting their time and attention in terms of if they want to improve? What, what's the most useful way they can use those other couple of training sessions a week to maximise? Uh, 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 shall I jump in there, Jess? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I think if you can if you can encourage them to at least get 20 minutes solo practice mm-hmm. just hitting the squash ball feeling the ball on the strings how to use the strings how to use the strings to shape the ball and then if you've worked with these guys over you know a, a course of a few weeks with some practice then pair them up and then go right off you go guys go and practice those together mm-hmm. but the squash is one of those sports where they're, they don't want to practice they want the club player wants to play and i totally get that that's you know <laughs> they want to play they want to have that buzz of competing and winning and and that but i think if you can encourage them to play practice just a little bit pair them up similar abilities, give them half a dozen practices, routines to do, and then go and play. That I have seen seen quite a lot of improvement in the in in the past sort of eighteen months with that 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 approach. Yeah, for, for me it's it's um and I almost stumbled across this maybe a couple of years ago where I think if it's if, if you're looking for those quick wins, if we can call it that, um, for me, ghosting, a physical side of it. Um, one of yeah. one of our players, you might know him, Alex Edge, uh, he's come to a few camps, lovely guy. Yeah. And he, and and he came to me, you know, a while back and was like, oh my goodness, I hated having to drag myself to do it. But I decided to do, come down, book the court before I played, do a little bit of ghosting 
And he said within three sessions of ghosting, his balance, his composure on the shots, the way he was able to be much more consistent, I found that super interesting. That, that again, I probably would have been a bit more, um, oh yeah, come, come to a few more club nights and let's get a few more one-to-ones in. But he said, and, and then I've translated that to a few other people, is a tiny bit of the physical element, whether it is, right, let's get a bit of, and, and ghosting for me is the best one, if I'm honest, because he just said he just felt like mm. there was this, Something had clicked. He felt like he was gliding across the court, the balance, the control. And, and that was from a, such a minimal amount of input. And, and he himself, just hearing it from him, didn't think it would have even close to that amount of impact. And yeah, he went from like a middle of box one, just winning the Premier League re- relatively regular now. Uh, and I think that that for me would be one of my early bits. If someone says, give me some advice on what to do in the shortest space of time possible that I can make the most improvement. I completely agree. Solo is a great one, but my, my little point right at this moment would it's be, yeah, you know, yeah, go, go get your legs strong, go get some balance, yeah. Go, yeah. go and feel like composure over the shot by adding yeah. in some ghosting. And yeah. yeah, it really opened him up his mindset and his, his, his viewpoint on it. I mean, I've always, I've always said you're only as good as your movement ultimately in the, if your movement, either you're not going to get to the ball at all and you're not going to stay in the rally <laughs> if your movement's really poor or you're going to get there and you're going to be off balance or you're going to be there late unless somebody's just putting the ball in your racket all the time. So, you know, for me, solo and ghosting, they go hand in hand, right? That's the beauty of them. It's very easy to yeah. go into yeah. half an hour solo and then do a 10-minute ghost at the end. And that's a good workout. You do 30 seconds on, 30 yeah, yeah. seconds off, you know? It's, very good. yeah. Uh, and then you get that fix, you know, you get that technical fix, you get hit, hitting the ball and then you get a physical workout, suddenly 45 minutes, it's, it's a training session. And yeah. if, if an amateur player can drop that in, you know, once a, day, once a week, you know, and then in my mind, you're, if you're coupling that up with, a, you know, whether it's a, a coaching lesson one, every week or every couple of weeks to just fine tune some technique and then you've got that competitive environment with routines and condition games to put it all into practice and then your match play you're going to be you're going to be in pretty good shape i don't don't see how you're not going to be Mm -hmm. as a squash player Um, i mean jonas said it didn't he in uh in his recent interview there's no reason why a squash player going 30 40 50 as they get older there's no reason they should ever stop improving their ball control improving their ball control you know maybe physically as you get a certain point but, it, you know, if you think as coaches, I'm sure you went through it the same as I did, that transition from being a player to a coach. You think how much better your ball control got, how much, you know, you'd be able to yeah. drop the ball, or put the ball into a spot with your feeding. You know, that's just, that's just from, from him. So I pose this to you. Who, who, who's got more skill? Who's got more accuracy, Jethro or Greg Lobbin? <laughs> <laughs> did you see that yesterday? No, no. what was that? What's that? Oh, it was like it made the BBC news. I was just turned the news on, and uh, uh, Greg was hitting this ball out. It was outside, called the toilet toilet roll challenge, and he hit the ball off the, off a wall, <laughs> and it landed in, into into the centre of the toilet roll. So, no way! Yeah, yeah, it was. It made the BBC news. So it was brilliant. Mm, yeah. Well, in yeah. answer to your question, I'd say Greg yeah. Lobben then. <laughs> 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 it's like put, put, you, put you guys on a squash court, Jethro. I reckon that backhand oh. drop of yours. Oh, uh, if you're standing no. still and you need to execute on on. I'd put my no, mate, on no, 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 no. You need to stick him on a <laughs> stick him on a Swiss ball, and then we'll see what he's made. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, that's. I think there's some really interesting, uh, interesting points there. Just talking about some some coaching philosophies. I don't want to. I don't want this to, to drag on too long. Um, what I do want to talk about is, is a new feature we're going to be launching here on, on Squash Skills, where we're going to be trying to build the ultimate squash player. And we're going to pull in certain elements or attributes of historic figures, current players that we like. And we're going to throw this out uh, to the Squash Skills members and get their opinion. But I also want to do it as part of this podcast series, working with coaches and getting their different opinions on uh we're just going to focus on a couple of elements and then the next the next interview we'll we'll throw it out and discuss it again and this week we're going to be discussing who has the best volley in the game now this is obviously an interesting topic because i think you'd probably argue that the game's got faster there's a lot more volleying in the modern day i'm aware we touched upon probably more historical figures in that length hitting conversation so so yeah cuts let's um let's hear your thoughts on on your dream volleyer 
not for not for what he'd done with the ball, but more for the fact of just getting onto the ball. And I think Pete Nichol really pushed forward so much. You know, he was fully extended. He wasn't trying to do anything with it. He just plopped the ball. Go and get that one. Go and get that one. Go and get that one. He just kept pushing forward. So I remember watching. I think one one of the, one of the best games I've seen was the final of the uh, Commonwealth Games in, in Melbourne with him and David Palmer. And the volley in there was absolutely unbelievable. And that's somebody that we we didn't mention. Another great great player that line and length was absolutely immaculate. But Palmer pushing forward and then Pete pushing even further forward. So perhaps not quite from the modern modern game, but I, you know I, I was always I always when I talk about volleying and and, and trying to just take the pressure off yourself and put the pressure onto, it to, uh, onto your opponent. I always talk about getting out and just plopping, sorry, left-handed, plopping the ball on, on, the, on the wall, you know. And would you say that was a bit of a transition? I mean, can you, you can talk about it from experience. Was there, a, in that, that era, did volleying become much more apparent or was it still a core part of the game with the likes of Jahangir and Rod? Or was yeah, there... I think Jahangir, Jahangir was awesome on the backhand volley. He's, he was absolutely so powerful. And Dittmar, you know, and Rodney Mark, but we said he, cha- he changed the game. He stepped forward. Then people like Rodney Arles used to volley. And, and we haven't mentioned Janshi. Janshi volley. Mm-hmm. You know, they're all, they all, they're all yeah. great, great, great squad players. Like, like Jess said, you know, they're all brilliant. You know, yeah. I think... If more modern times, I'd, I'd go for Pete. I think if if we were going back a little bit, I'd, I'd go for for for, for your age there, Karts. I know it's about modern no. times with Pete's been retired <laughs> for fifteen years. <laughs> oh, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so what about you, Jess? What do you what do you think in terms of? So your two two people come to mind, and and again, apologies for not mentioning probably another twenty people, but yeah, I think it, I'm going to go very modern here. I would say it's a combination. I, I'm I'm really enjoying what Ali Farag does on his backhand. The way his, mm-hmm. but it's, it's his T position. It's he he hits a length of say seven out of ten. He is volleying that next ball pretty much. If that guy's trying to hit a length yeah. of his decent length, he's moved to a part of the court and he is getting bats on ball. It's almost like what I like about him. He's he does it so effortlessly. You don't see any force. You don't see any. You know, if you maybe look at a Pete Nichol, Dave Palmer, he had physical. There was a big physical push to do it, mm. and it was it was hard. Whereas Ali seems to do it on that backhand so effortless. He, he, I think it's a combination of reading it well. He knows his quality of length. He shifts across. So He's about six Ali inches Farrak- taller than Pete, though, as well. You've got to remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, advantage okay. of Wigs, yeah. Obviously plays into, into that. Um, but I, I actually think that there's an underpinning of reading it. I, I watched um, him play Paul Cole maybe two years ago before Paul made his breakthrough. I think Paul was still top 15. And no disrespect to Paul, but it looked like a feeding session for Ali. He knew exactly where that ball was going. Ali was moving into it. Paul would play it, bang, it was gone. And it, it, it Paul's developed his game loads since then. That really started to think, get me to think about Ali's volley on his backhand. But then if I'm looking at the forehand, uh, Mohamed al Shabagi, I, I think when he gets into that, you know, the commentators talk about that beast mode of his, he ain't letting anything come past that forehand. You know, if he's not going to volley, he's taking it as it bounces. So it's almost like the mindset and the brute force that, that Shabagi has on the forehand. I would, I would, I would kind of like to mold those two together in a way. I can't really pick one at the moment, but the backhand for Ali Farag and the brute force and mindset and relentlessness of Shabagi on the forehand would be my two picks. I mean, I want to just throw... Uh, a Tarek moment in there at the mm-hmm. moment with a desire. It's more an attacking desire, I guess, but he's looking to get on the volley and take the ball in short all the time, isn't he? I think it's just it's just interesting yeah. to watch. You know, he's almost the epitome of where Egyptian squash got to in terms of this yeah. attacking nature. And yeah. I see, yeah. you know, the likes of Paul Cole and John Macon now maybe you know reining things back in the in the modern game a little bit from everything going to the front it's yeah. shifted a little bit but Tarek it seems like every opportunity to get a volley drop in or you know fade mm-hmm. something into the front he's he's got that mad desire to volley and he's not the biggest either is he Tarek so he's you know yeah. in, in comparison to Ali but I think for me having played against it and there's a funny video on YouTube where Pete and I uh, with early days of squash skills I put a a GoPro on my head and did a video of what's it like to play Pete Nick or play Pete Nick. And it's all they saw, all you saw with this GoPro was the back corners. And it was just me looking at Pete's head and him just going side side. And this was when he was got 42, 43, you know, he was 
you know, long, long retired, but this desire to, to volley was, was relentless. So, you know, he wasn't known for that kind of crazy shot playing ability as, you know, someone like Mohammed or, or taking balls short. But as, as Kart said, it was just relentless pressure that just became so hard to deal with and, you know, experiencing it on a, on a personal level. But yeah, he was, Peter would, was going to be my kind of nomination for relentless but, to volley. Um, Sorry to jump in here. There's probably two guys we've not mentioned that just should be at the top of the list. It was Nick Matthew and yeah. Rami Ashur. You know, yeah. they, they, you could argue, they changed, they both changed the game. And you yeah. can't even mention them. You know, we're talking yeah. about yeah. subtleties of Ali and Shibagi and Pete Nickel. But ooh, I, we can't even have this conversation without putting yeah. Nick and Rami in there for different reasons, I think, as mm. well. Like, mm. I, what do you think? Like, 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 I'm interested to hear from you guys about the differences between Nick and Rami's volleys, what, what I, do you think? I, I was thinking exactly the same thing, as I said, it was mm. like, this it feels like a silly conversation not to, to bring them in. I think <laughs> if you looked at pure height of T position ever, I don't think you, there's been two players who pushed further up the court and had more of a desire to volley than those two. If you mm. think about how far up the court mm. they are. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, mm. And Nick was cutting the ball off anywhere, wasn't he? You know, he had bought in the, the cross court volley lob as well. Yeah. Did things differently. Yeah. That forehand volley. I mean, that yeah. stride forward and played playing that forehand volley drop into the front right off a loose cross court. It was it was ridiculous. Yeah. But then yeah. I think Rami's more known Another. for those reactive quick volley than obviously the outrageous, outrageous yeah. winners. So to come back to the original question, if we're gonna <laughs> pick we're gonna pick one we've there are two votes in there for Pete Nick, but then you've got Rami and, Rami and Nick in there. So what I'm, I'm going to, even though I didn't mention him my first, I, I think I'll have to put Nick up there as the both sides. You know, like I think I said for Farag back and Shabagi forehand, but Nick is the combination of both sides and, and the high T position. I would throw Nick in, but it sounds okay. like I might have been outvoted for with Pete Nick. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Pete Nick in. Yes, a business partner flying the squash skills flag. So I'm gonna, <laughs> oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nominate Pete. Bonus time. But then Bonus. Carts, I'm throwing. Well, uh, given the fact you've coached both of them to world championships, this is this is on you, pal. So oh. who who are you gonna choose, Nick or Pete? As, oh. as you... I'm gonna go Nick Matthew. There you go. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Pete. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'd like to thank you both, gentlemen, for what has oh, been a pleasure. Really enjoyed what's, it. What has been a, an interesting chat covering coaching philosophy and then, you know, the length and the, and the volleyers. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, stay safe. And no doubt. Yeah. We'll, uh, yeah. Be in touch. Thanks. thanks. Take thank care, guys. Really, really enjoyed like, that. Uh, yeah. First, first one of, of many for the Squash Skills podcast series. So, hopefully, you guys enjoyed. Um, and yeah, Jeff, I'm sure you're going to come up with some some great ideas for some guests in the near future, aren't we? Absolutely. Right. Awesome. Cool. Over Thank now. you, fellas. Take it easy. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye.